How you doing? This is Henry Grijon. We're live here, team live here from the East Coast and getting together again with my good friends, Edwin Duterte and Dr. Annette Tejero. And we are here today with a special guest. And all, the, all our guests are special. We don't want to say just one particular person, but <laughs> I've met her, Vivian Z Zayas. Am I saying it right, Vivian? Your last name? I usually kill yes, people's last name. Good. Zayas. And, Zayas. And she is the founder, and she runs actually with her sister, Voices for Senior, out here in the East Coast. And we wanted to bring her on. We have lots to talk about. Uh, it's a very serious subject, and where um, she lost her mother. And she's going to talk about this when she gets into this. Uh, I have my grandmother, who is 98 years old, in a nursing home. And we are facing, uh, it's just horrible what we're facing. Here in New York, we have a large number of deaths. I think it's about, 6,500, am I correct, Vivian? I mean, I'm, those numbers change all the time and it's growing. Yeah, and, upward of 62, that I know for sure. Okay, okay, so when we get to that, we'll speak on that, uh, but we'll get this intro going and I'll let everybody introduce themselves before we start. Uh, your mute, Edwin, your mute button. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Edwin, we can't hear you. Okay, right. Edwin. I, I, I'm back. I, uh, my computer froze, everything froze. That's okay. So, All right. Uh, so we're up to you. You can give your intro. You can introduce yourself, your, a little bit of your background, then we go to Dr. Nett, and then we'll, we'll open the, the floor to our guest. Go ahead, Edwin. Oh, good, good afternoon, Vivian. My name is Edwin Duterte. I'm uh, in the Los Angeles, uh, California area. Uh, I, my background is real estate, and I'm, right now I'm focusing on uh, the senior housing and convalescent care uh, industry. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be opening up, uh, you know, start development of uh, different uh, housing options for seniors. And your former background, I know you were an uh, ex-candidate for uh, Congress. I yeah, yeah. For congressional. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I, ra I ran for U.S. Congress uh, because I think we can make a difference. Um, you know, so, but right now, I think it's very important that we uh, uh, just uh, uncover and explores, uh, explore different options for, for our seniors. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I did run for office, and, uh, and, I, and I learned a lot from um, – working with Dr. Annette, who also ran for Congress and who I was a part of her staff back in 2014 and 2016. Cool, cool. Dr. Annette Tejero, a good friend of ours. Uh, she is a doctor and a statistologist. Want to give us a little bit about your background and uh, not only being a doctor, but also you ran for office too. Yes, I did run for office. Uh, I ran for Congress because I think that we needed to have more healthcare professionals in Congress for s addressing some of these problems that we have right now, actually. Um, and that path started obviously because of the Affordable Care Act that's not so affordable and not so great for patients as we're slowly finding out. Um, but I am an anesthesiologist, I'm a medical doctor, and I also have over two decades of experience with healthcare policy, which means that when legislators meet, um, I try and advocate for our patients and for healthcare so that they don't inadvertently pass legislation that either is meaningless or have a, a negative impact on our patients' lives. Um, we cannot expect legislators, especially ones that don't have any healthcare background, to understand the implications of what it is that they will be doing. Uh, when they pass these laws. And unfortunately, it makes it very, very difficult for some of us in the healthcare field to make sure that everybody stays healthy or that we avert problems because paper, paper pushers, bureaucrats see this as, oh, well, this will work out fine. But in actuality, the, in the implementation, people are, are put at risk. Awesome, awesome. So before I go to introduce our guests and she can speak, uh, here in New York, we, in other states, we have uh, a crisis right now. New York State Legislator on 7-13-2020 have just announced they're going to be two separate hearings in the month of August. August 3rd, 2020 is going to be the upstate. Uh, uh, they're going to be speaking on what happened with the nursing homes in upstate. And then 8-10-2020, the downstate, which is considered the New York area. And this is big because not only have so many people lost their lives, but our guest, Vivian Zayas, she lost her mother 
She'll speak on detail. We're going to give her the floor as much time as you need. And she can get into it on, on what her experience with her family, but also her role. Why does she take such a big role on dealing now with the senior citizen crisis? Vivian, how are you? Welcome to Team Thank Live. And, and we're here. We're very glad that you're here. How are you doing? And the floor Good. is yours. I want to first thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be among you guys, and um, especially if you're fighters like me um, for our country and also for our seniors. Um, humble beginnings. Um, my mother, uh, who came from Puerto Rico, she was uh, an orphan at a very young age. She was a, a fighter, and she um, worked very, very hard. And my sister and I, um, we were caring for her in these last days when she needed a knee surgery due to the effects of arthritis. And when her leg started to, she was prone to falling because the, ne the leg was in really bad shape. We told her, let's just have the surgery. There's nothing to fear. Technology has improved. It's her first surgery ever. So we were just trying to make her comfortable with this whole endeavor of getting a knee replacement. She gets her knee replacement in August and I'm already, I'm a very positive person, so I'm thinking, okay, so two months of uh, rehab, she'll be back in her house by November. Who knows if she'll be cooking Thanksgiving dinner back in her house. So come November, everything actually with the surgery went well. And she's gone to therapy, but she's still complaining of some back aches and some bad back problems. So we're like, okay, we cannot do any other procedures until you're recuperating from this first one. So we are here just giving her therapy, uh, caring for her, but she's still complaining of back issues. So we take her to a specialist and they said, look, your mother just had surgery. Um, we would suggest a good six months before we pursue any other, um, any other avenues for her. What they found out was chronic spinal stenosis. So She's in our house trying to recuperate, and here we are uh, end of, after Christmas, and she shows me uh, what was an abscess that developed in her leg. So we're like, Mom, why didn't you tell us about this sooner? Because by the time she showed it to me, it was fairly large. And parents at that age sometimes don't want to worry the kids, so they stay quiet, and they try to fend for it on their own. And by the time they show it to us, it's something a lot more complicated. So... We told, uh, I called my sister and she's apparently said, look, just let's wait out a day or two and we'll take her to the ER and just have it looked at. We go to the ER on January 3rd, um, bright and early. We showered her and got her dressed, took her in and they decided to keep her, put her on antibiotics. So she stays there a week and on August 8th, instead of them sending her back home, they sent her to this rehab, which was right behind the facility. Uh, right behind the hospital and she was there which we thought would be for a week and then they say well we're gonna send her to the rehab because she's still a little wobbly on her feet uh, initially we thought it was a great idea for her to have full-time inpatient therapy for a good four weeks six weeks which, which is what we were told when um, three weeks later we have a meeting with the nurses and the um, social workers arranging her discharge so we're like, great, she's going to go home. She's had additional therapy. They tell me, if you want an aide, a home attendant at her house, then in Brooklyn, it will be about two weeks. If you want an aide in Long Island, which is where I live, it would take about um, a, a lot longer. So we were like, no, um, she wants to be back in her apartment. Let's get the aide in Brooklyn. When... The estimated time rolled around and we still didn't have an aid. We started calling the facility and calling the social worker and calling the, the insurance company. That's when we were getting the runaround, leaving messages that were not being answered. And, you know, we had very small issues here and there at the facility, but we kept pushing because we were thinking she's only here for a couple of weeks. Let's grin and bear it and, and she'll be home. But when COVID started um, into the mix, we we weren't really paying a lot of attention because we're like, she's not going to be here. And this is over in the city. She's safe where she is. She lives in Brooklyn where we thought that a home attendant traveling in mass transportation would bring it into her home. So we, told, we, we felt like, stay where you are. You're safe where you are. And when end of February came, we're still pushing to get her out of there. 
she's getting very homesick. We're telling her, just hang in there. We're safe here. We want to keep you safe. There's a deadly thing going on outside. Um, she's trying to hang in there, but she's, she's getting really homesick. By the March 11th, we get a phone call saying we're shutting down the facility. And, you know, if you want to see your mother, you have to come in today because, you know, no more visitors after today. So my sister and I rushed there. We brought magazines, puzzles, things to keep her busy, batteries for her little radio. And all of a sudden, we gave her a kiss. And I never believed or thought in my mind that that little kiss that I gave her was my last kiss. I... You know, it was already 7.40 at night. I had to pick up my daughter who was at, um, at a play date. And I, I wish I had taken a little bit more time because, you know, I sat with her for a little while. I, I gave her a little pep talk and said, just hang in there. We're here for you. We're going to be calling you. We're fighting to get you out of here. You know, here's puzzles, magazines, and some goodies to keep you busy. Two or three weeks, and we'll see you then. And we told the family, please call her. Let's keep her morale up. And, you know, that's what we thought we were, you know, were doing in her best interest. So when they shut the facility, we get this interesting letter in the mail that says, we have now suspended all visitations and we have put all precautions in place uh, to safeguard the security of our seniors. That's all I needed to hear. That the place where she was, what put every precaution in place to take care of my mother. After um, a week, we're still pushing and calling. And I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm really upset. And I'm like, my mother wants to get out of there. What's going on? Why aren't you returning my phone calls? The case manager's not returning my phone calls. The social worker's not returning my phone calls. The head nurse is bouncing my calls to the case manager. The insurance company's not responding. So I am telling them my mother needs to get out of here. <laughs> so when... When that March 19th was that, I believe that Friday, I get a call from the social worker and she's telling me, I'm going to take over your case. I'm escalating it to someone else and we'll help you, or, you know, help everything, arrange everything to get your mother home. Now, um, Monday comes along the 23rd and she's telling me, you know, we apologize for all the running around. We're going to get you um, the help you need with her, her stomach. Um, she told me that everything hurt, that her stomach hurt. She wasn't really eating, but still we were not 100%. The flags were not up yet. So Thursday comes along. I call her, but by the time I call, it's eight something, and she's telling me she's tired, she's sleepy, and that I would call her tomorrow. So I called her Friday. At Friday, uh, 4 o'clock, I receive a call saying, your mother's going home on Monday. And we were elated but concerned. We were like, okay, if we, now we send her home and she gets sick, we're, we thought that, she would blame us. Like, you know, we, we did what you wanted us to do. Now we took you home. If you get sick, we would feel responsible. So we were walking cautiously to get her home, which is what she wanted. But when I heard her voice on that Friday, she was hoarse. And I was like, oh, mom, like you're going home on Monday. She was so excited. And she told me, do this and do that. Take my things home. And when I hear her horse, I said, mom, you cannot get sick now because they won't let you go home. I told her, make sure you're eating and that you're doing, you know, what you need to do so you're strong to go home on Monday. Saturday evening, I call her and I cannot make out what she's saying. It was this frightening garbled mess that all I can do was tell her, hang up, hang up, I'm calling the nurse. But I call the nurse six times before I get someone to answer the phone. And what they tell me is, your mother's fine. She doesn't have a fever. Um, her vitals are okay and her oxygen levels are fine. I still don't understand why they're telling me this. They didn't come out and say, look, your mom's been exposed to COVID and we're monitoring her so far. This is the vitals. Because my sister and I would have raised the roof, either finding out what the symptoms were of COVID, because that's why we would have known that she was already displaying the, act, the, the symptoms. And two, we would have gotten somehow a way of getting in or getting her out. But they downplayed it. She's fine. Everything's okay. She's all right. So I'm like, why does she sound like that? No answer. But I asked the nurse, if there was any fear or any concern or my mother was any danger, would you tell me? And she tells me, yeah, she would. So that also was the second layer of calm. I was like, okay, I'm overreacting. I told my husband, maybe I should call a, a police officer and ask for an escort to see her. And all I needed is five minutes. I didn't even think the police would let me in or go with me. But this is what I'm telling my family. 
But then again, I start remembering what they're telling me. She's fine. She doesn't have a fever and her vitals are okay. So I'm thinking I'm going to be this overreactive daughter showing up there, raising, raising the roof and she's fine. Simple case of laryngitis or a cold or bronchitis, which in elderly cases is not so simple. So we come um, Sunday. Now we're not able to get a hold of her. We reach out to my sister and I'm like, have you spoken to mom? I cannot get a hold of her. And we're here saying, okay, well, she's going home Monday anyway. Uh, we'll take her to her family doctor. But that Monday morning, we would think that she's so excited to go home. We can't get her on the phone. We're wondering why, if she's so excited, after weeks and weeks of telling us, I want to go home, I want to go home, we cannot get her on the phone. So that starts raising really loud bells. And we call, my sister and I split the phone call. I called the case manager and my sister calls the, the director. The case manager tells me, the doctor has cleared your mother for discharge. Her chart is here before me. He's checked off and everything. She's fine. And I'm like, so if she's so fine. Why can't I talk to her? Why won't she come to the phone? Why won't she answer to the phone? And she had no answer to me. She goes, all I know is that the doctors cleared her for discharge. So although I didn't know what I was saying, I told her, is it your policy to release sick patients and she stood quiet and so quiet that it was so awkward that she stood quiet for a long time that I broke the silence by saying look have you seen my mother and she says no I said well why don't you go take a look at my mom and if she looks okay to you <laughs> instead of having the ambulet go um, pick her up and take her to Brooklyn I will go personally and I'll pick her up myself and she hesitated and said, uh, okay. So I hang up the phone and I wait. Then I get a call in a little while and say, your mother, um, the doctor was in with your mother because now my sister's already uh, pulled uh, the necktie of the director who says to her, I don't know why your mother's having trouble breathing. And I'm thinking like, you just cleared her for discharge. Now you're telling us you don't know why she's having trouble breathing. And then he says, we can send her home with an oxygen tank. My sister says, oh, and they asked if she was a smoker, which she wasn't. So we were like, no, she didn't come in with respiratory issues. She has had no history of respiratory issues. Besides a cold and sniffles or anything like that, where she's taken a butyrol for, you know, because they, they don't like giving um, antibiotics to seniors too often. So they let the body kind of run its course and hopefully fend for it on, on, its, on its own. So at the end of the day, they don't know supposedly why she's having trouble breathing. Still, no one has told us she's been exposed to COVID. Still, we're wondering why on the day she's supposed to go home, we still can't talk to her on the phone if she's so well to go home. So my, my sister kind of got upset at the, at the director and said, you better find out what's wrong with my mother. And now my sister and I are both like call, calling each other worried. When we get a call from the case manager, she says to me, the doctor's in there and he's going to schedule an x-ray, chest x-ray. We're like, okay, she's finally getting medical attention. Great. But they didn't tell us that they didn't have an inside tech. So my mother wait, waited there for hours with the difficulty breathing that they said. And they didn't put that in as an emergency. So the technician came as a routine. They checked my mother. The x-ray came back three hours later. My mother sat there with difficulty breathing from the morning that she's supposed to go home till almost 7 p.m. when we receive a phone call says, um, we don't like how your mother's breathing, we're sending her to the emergency room. We're wondering, my mother was supposed to go home, and she was well enough to go home, how is she now, you know, and I think that the only reason that my mother got some extra care that day was because she was scheduled to go home. If not, and if she was not on their radar for discharge, she would have been in her room, struggling to breathe, with no help, and obviously now I can go in because I would have fought for her. And when they get, we get this call that she's being sent to the hospital, we're like, okay, she's going to get care finally because you guys are not doing much for her. And we call that night. Obviously, they're doing their chat, their scans of her. Um, the ambulance took an hour and 15 minutes to get to her. So, and I believe she was going into respiratory distress, which is another issue. And then by the next morning, she's basically um, has a collapsed lung and she's on a respirator. So my sister and I are completely baffled, angry, upset, 
wondering why or what's going on with her. And we're asking them, you know, was it COVID? Did she have COVID? And they said, well, look, we took the test. We don't have the results back yet. And they give her this huge battery of antibiotics. Something that had she already shown symptoms of pneumonia or respiratory issue, they should have given her something. But instead, they figure she's going home. That's not our problem at this point. And they were, they were actually discharging sick patients so that they would not die in, 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 in their watch. So we know that 42 patients died at that facility. And we have connected with at least another four families that have died outside of the facility, like my mother, who were discharged despite the fact that they were COVID exposed or what they called COVID suspect. And the fact that there was a paper in my mother's chart that said that she was uh, called droplet precautions. It's either someone expo uh, exposed her, someone sneezed on her, coughed on her, or some nurse had it and then walked in and you know, there was some kind of a, a correlation there. So they never said your mother was exposed. Even as early as Wednesday, they never said um, your mother was exposed, despite the fact that there was an entry in her chart and a paper that she was supposedly uh, exposed. They were gonna discharge her despite being exposed. They were gonna discharge her despite showing all the symptoms of COVID and releasing her to daughters, grandchildren, and two of her siblings, which were over 75, uh, of age. So, and the fact that the, the nursing attendant, home attendant, would have been exposed to COVID on her first day of work attending to my mother. So it was a complete web of what their action did was to not assume liability for my mother's care. Um, they discharged her and not knowing the ramifications of that as well to the public and the family. So now my mother's in the hospital. She's showing um, improvement when they started giving her the antibiotics. We're thinking if she can just hang in there a couple of more days, she'll clear this, this, this risk. Very optimistic on our part um, because we didn't know how bad um, or how long she had been fighting these symptoms. So we're thinking she's showing, we're getting positive news and we're like, okay, great. You know, like just hang in there, you know? We're not thinking on, our mind was always on she's gonna be home. Let's, let's get together as a family and just rotate um, her care so that when the home attendant's home, we're can, we can help out in the evenings and we'll take it from there. Never imagining that within uh, 24, 48 hours, she was you know, gonna be clean for her life. So on Wednesday morning, we get positive news. Um, her lung is improving and the bacteria and the virus is, is, is going down. We're like, great, you know, like this is, you know, we're taking a big deep, deep sigh of relief. And by 6 p.m. that evening, she was supposed to get dialysis because they said that um, she was not able to go to the bathroom because she's been in bed. And they, it was, they, they made it sound routine, so I wasn't totally worried, but I was like, okay, you know, if it has to be done, fine. They mentioned some risks, but never anything supposedly life-threatening. So we were saying, okay, go ahead. But we get a call from a renal specialist, and he says to me half an hour later, uh, your mother's blood pressure is dropping. We're sustaining it medically. Um, it looks like her kidneys are starting to fail. And some patients, when we do this treatment, will, will pass away, will go. Normally, I have my sister on the other line, so we both hear what they say. But this time, I was alone on the call, and my jaw dropped. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, Are you, you just told me she was doing better. Now it's, she's might not make it. Um, so I was, he says, if she goes, would you like us to resuscitate her? Which I found such a baffling question. I was like, of course I want you to resuscitate her. But then she tells me, he tells me, if we resuscitate her, we have to break her ribs. And I am just like, oh my Lord, how, how do I have to make this decision? And I just basically took a big deep, deep sigh and said, please do the best you can. She's my only mom. And, and like, how can I survive? when she's abruptly taken from me. So he told me he would, but 45 minutes later, I get a call that she passed away. My husband was sitting by me when I get the call. So I just kind of like mouthed it with no words, like she passed. And he just looked at me and I'm like, now I have to call my sister who's younger than I and tell her mom passed. You know? And I remember that her and I, like she collapsed in Brooklyn. I collapsed in, in my home, we were crying uh, hysterically on the phone. 
and we're like, now we go into angry mode because we're like, how did this happen? Like, you know, what's going on here? And in disbelief, we, we thought my mom who was 78 years old would be with us for a long time. Never imagining that we go from hours to go home to being obviously um, dead in, the, in a facility. We weren't able to see her before. We weren't able to see her afterwards because the option was given to us. If you come and see her, you can see her. But I didn't think I would make it there in time. Secondly, I thought about the trauma of seeing her the way I last saw her when I gave her that last kiss to seeing her with tubes down her throat and that kind of thing. And I was just not prepared for that, for that to be my last image of her. So I told the doctors, um, my sister told me, absolutely not. She's not going to go see her. And then I was debating it, but then he tells me, you're going to have to quarantine for 14 days. And I'm thinking, so now my mother passes abruptly and then I have to go somewhere somewhere else away from my family and and go through this by myself for 14 days so i decided not to see her and um then afterwards they, they tell us you know it's direct cremation or direct um uh, burial and i'm like okay so now we can't see her before we couldn't see her after we can't even say goodbye to her the way you know we normally would um in a casket and that kind of thing then no one's allowed you can't go to the funeral. You can't go to the cemetery. And we're just like, it's, it's pain after pain after pain. So when the dust settles after about a week, we start to ask questions like, how did this happen? Where, how did she fall through the cracks? Who else did this happen to? And we decide to put a post on the Facebook page of the facility. We put a picture of her. And we put, there's COVID in the facility, get your families out. Our mother passed away, that kind of thing. We believe that the facility took down the post. So we went ahead and posted it again. A family who had been asking questions about her mother found the post and then reached out to them and said, listen, I heard that there's COVID there. And that's how- Vivian, I'm sorry. Uh, we're about to go to break. Um, this is an incredible, testimony when we come back from break vivian we're going to allow you to continue um and i'm very sure i see dr net and edwin are they want to really jump in and really uh you know find out more because we're learning so much that so many families is that okay so we're going to go to break sure, sure. and and when we come back from break we're going to be live again with vivian zayas who is the founder and a person who was working with uh, senior uh, voices for senior, along with Dr. Net Tejero, who is from Nevada, and Edwin Derote from California, and yours truly from New York City here, Henry Grijon. So we can go on a break, and when we come back, we'll continue. We'll allow you to take, you know, where you were, just take off where you were at, and then uh, we'll get into uh, both my co hosts as we get started. Is that good? Sure. Okay, so we'll go on a break now. Thank you so much, and we'll come back in a few. All right, Edwin? <laughs> 